بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful لا اله الا الله لا Others 
and how we allow our minds to wander. May Allah protect us. How our minds operate, that too is governed by the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, many of us sometimes hear things and we relate things. The Prophet says in one narration, Kaka bil marki kadiban and you hadi ka bil kulli masana. It is sufficient to qualify a person as a liar if he or she relates or narrates everything he or her hears. So everything I hear, I narrate it. It's enough for me to be a liar because some of what I've said, some of what I've related would definitely be the lies that others have either fabricated or narrated knowingly or unknowingly. So it's important for me to vet whatever I hear and to make sure that before I process it in the wrong way, I better look at it in the right way, in the light of Islam. If it does not concern me, I don't need to talk about it. If it does concern me, I need to make sure it is the truth. Until I cannot verify its truthfulness, I will not relate it and I will hold it at bay. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. The verses I read before you are a few verses of Surah Al-Nur. But Surah Al-Nur is an important surah in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has expressed in the cleansing or the clarification of many issues and the ruling of the segregation between men and women, the ruling of the etiquette of the relation between men and women from a certain angle. And this is mentioned in this particular surah, a lot of the goodness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken about and it is not a coincidence that it is called surah al-nur, the surah named after the light and the nur. I call upon you to go through its verses slowly, to learn the meanings, to look into how it is applicable in your lives and in mine, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all purity and goodness. There is a point that I had thought about just before I entered. Something that came to my mind which was very, very interesting. And I thought it depicts how dangerous it is to jump to conclusions. In this story we are mentioning this evening, the main point is that people jumped to conclusions and sometimes they create a conclusion knowing that it is untrue. You look at how Aisha Allah was accused, we're going to get to the details of it inshallah. But sometimes it starts off as a habit. People love to jump to conclusions. We see two people together and we begin to think, a couple, you know, this is happening, that's happening. Why do we have to jump to conclusions? So, there is a story on a lighter note that I'd like to say to you. You know, people actually, uh, when I heard the response of the salam coming from there, I almost jumped out of my skin, but I decided to laugh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all salam and peace. I mean, so, there was a man who, and this is a true story, I was told it by someone who said that he was a witness to it. Allah, you know, like, it's something that you might tell me, well, did you authenticate it, did you verify it? Good question. The reality is the point we are deriving from it is good enough. So the man says, uh, he joined Salat al-Fajr after he was quite lazy to read Salat for a while and he started reading Salat, so he comes in for Salat al-Fajr and as he joins the Imam, the Imam is now reading Surat al-Baqarah and he continues, you know, Surat al-Baqarah is the longest Surah. So he's reading Surah Al-Baqarah and he goes on and on and on. This man is standing and he's so tired and he's thinking to himself, is this what Salat Al-Fajr is all about? You know, and he's thinking so many things in his Salah that when the Salah is over, he asks the man next to him, what Surah was that? He says, it is the cow. The cow, the Baqarah. The meaning of the Baqarah is the cow. So he says, it's the cow. So the young, the young man says, that was a long Surah. Very, very long Surah. In fact, not the whole surah was said, but a lot of it. He says, oh, if that is the cow, next time I must ask before I actually join the salah. You know, I must wait until Allah Ta'ala, when the Imam starts, the next part, I will ask someone, what surah is this? And, you know, then we will make up our minds. This is weakness. So he arrives for Salat al Now look how he jumps to conclusions. This is what I'm raising. He jumps to conclusions. When he arrives for Salat al and the Imam says, what Allah Ta'ala, Alam tar kaita ta'ala rabbu ka bi ashabin fiil The man says, what's all right, sir? They say, it's the elephant. He said, who are we going to talk about? It's the elephant. 
He says, I better do it. I can't be a page. He says, no, 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 it's the shortest surah. One of the shortest surahs in the Quran. One of the short ones, you know. So, okay. The point I'm raising is, look, the conclusion he tried to jump to or make. One might think of it that, you know what? Yes, the elephant might be bigger. But you do not apply that in this situation. It is something totally different. You need to have knowledge. You need to base it on something solid. So people sometimes jump to conclusions and sin against themselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates her story. And let's listen to how she narrates it. She says, one of the battles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to draw the lot as to which of his wives he would take with him. And she says, it was my turn. And you know, we were going out. When they traveled out in the battles with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they used to travel on the conveyance and they had something known as a haulaj. A haulaj is more like uh, a little tank-like structure that is put a carrier at the top of an animal so that it protects from weather and it's a covering and so on. So it's on top of the camel who's sitting in it. I think here in Bahrain perhaps people might know exactly what I'm talking about and may have seen it. And so what happened? She was, she says, I was light. Light meaning I wasn't a heavy person. She was still quite young and light and so on. And they used to, once the, the females or the women are seated in, they would lift it up and put it on the top. So it was done in utmost respect. And this was after the rule of hijab. And so what happened, very interestingly, she says, on the return from the war, from the battle of Bani Musmalik, that was the battle. On the return from the battle of Bani Musmalik, she says that the army had stopped in a certain area and they obviously decided to rest for a moment and they put down my holdage, it came down and when it came down, the army carried on, the men did whatever they wanted to and I came out of it and I did whatever I had to and when I got back to where, to this holdage and we were supposed to now start leaving, I noticed that one of my necklaces or necklace that I had was missing and I decided to look for it and as I'm looking for it, you know, Round the side and the corners and the other side and this way and that way. They, they lifted the hobbit thinking that I was inside. They put it on the camel and they began to move. And the army was gone. By the time I came back with my necklace, so she did find it. And she says, when I came back, I noticed everyone's gone. Nobody's here. So I decided to sit exactly where I was. So that they would notice and come back to pick me up. Now this was a young woman, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi the most pure of all women, known as Ummul Mu'mineen, one of the uh, mothers of the believers, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace and blessings be upon them and upon all of us. So she says, a while later, a man came by with his conveyance, with his animal, with his camel, and he was a man who, who saw this black material on the ground, it was after he got, so obviously she was covered, and he saw that there is someone here. So as he slowed down and he tried to see who it was, he recognized the Aisha of Allah Anha, and he knew that there is something amiss, but there was no speech between them. She says, not a word was uttered between us, besides the fact that obviously he wanted to know who it was, and he wanted to help her. No word was uttered, nothing at all. Utmost respect, utmost respect. And he says, or she then says, that he allowed me to get on, he got his animal down, and I got onto it, and he got it up, and he walked with it, until we got to Al Madinah the Nawar. Now, if we were to pause there for a moment, this was not very far out of Madinah the Nawar. And this was in the broad daylight, in the afternoon time, when they arrived in Madinah. You know, a lot of the people were all there. They, some of the army had actually seen them coming in, and it was in broad daylight. And if I were to pause for a moment and ask you that if from amongst us, I'm sure there are the majority, the bulk, if not all of us, would believe that we have pure people who have pure intentions, alhamdulillah, who would do things solely for the sake of Allah. So if from amongst us they do exist, those who are better, those who are higher, those who are more pure. So if I know I am pure, I know that they were purer than me. So how dare me think bad? It's like the guy who's thinking Al-Fil is a longer surah just because of its name. The 
conclusion that he arrived at is far better than the conclusion that those who want to accuse others would arrive at because this makes a little bit of sense in it from one angle and one aspect, whereas the other one makes no sense whatsoever. How can you just accuse people? Is it because you have a dirty mind? Is it because you think like that? Or is it because you want to create a problem? Is it because you have just found an opportunity to, to bash at someone? And this is what we do sometimes when we become jealous of people. Small opportunity and we say, that's it. Yes, this person is like this. And I always knew that this was the case and so on. Without realizing that we are causing damage and harm to ourselves. When someone spreads a rumor about you, they are harming themselves. When we spread a rumor about someone else, we are harming ourselves. We are not harming them because Allah has said in the Quran, otherwise, Allah has said when a person comes to accuse you of something you have not done, remember it is better for you. You don't know, we know. We will get to those verses in a few moments. So here comes Aisha radiallahu anha. And as she comes in for her, she did not know anything. She got back home and she was happy. And then she noticed that the attitude of Rasulullah was not as it used to be in terms of his smile and the way he spoke and so on. He used to come in and greet me and instead of that broad smile and instead of you know, the speech that was loving and so on, he used to ask me a strange question. Strange question. He used to come in as-salamu alaykum. And then when she, he was replied, he would say, that would mean in the English language, how is that one? How is that one? What is meant by that? Obviously she was innocent. She still did not know that there is a story that is brewing in the city. The man who had given her a lift, so to speak, his name was Safwan ibn Muhammad. He was a Sulami and then a Zakwan. He was one of the high-ranking Sahaba a man whom they knew was pure. They all knew he was a good man. He was a man who lowered his gaze even ordinarily. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to lower our gazes. So, as he came in, Rasulullah would ask this question. And Aisha was a little bit uneasy. She did not know. She used to be at home all the time. She was at home. She hardly went out. One day she went out with a lady known as Um Misfah. Um Misfah anha, was the cousin of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, which means Abu Bakr as Siddiq, whose cousin would be the aunt of Aisha. One of the aunts of Aisha, anha, a second order cousin. Now, when the two of them went to so Aisha, anha, was um Misfah. as they were walking by and they, they were together, Um Misfah says, That is a Misfah. Now, that would mean Misbah is at a great loss, or in another word, perhaps destruction upon Misbah. Now, that's her own son. She's saying he's at a loss, or destruction being upon him, or what a loss he is in. And Ayatollah says, How could you say that? That is a man who took part in the battle of Badr, and you are saying that he's at a loss? What is it? So, when Misbah looks at Ayatollah and says, Did you not hear what he is saying? She says, no, what did he say? What is he saying? Then she told him, she told her, she told Aisha Allah Anha, that they are accusing you of having done wrong with Safwan ibn Mu'aqqal. And this is where she says, I was sick anyway, meaning I was feeling ill because of the treatment I was getting from Rasulullah which was not bad, but it was not good either. And I was used to so good treatment, you know, those who have husbands or wives, every time they're smiling at you and they're so happy and they always ask you brilliant questions, how are you? And they're always, you know, looking for phoning you every time and asking you even when they're away from you what's happening and so on. And the day you just see them somber, something tells you, did I do something wrong? It's not like they, they are doing something bad to you, they're just a little bit somber. They're, they perhaps have an attitude that you are not used to. So, they, we would feel, obviously, that if I did something wrong, did I say something wrong? Are you sure this is it's, it's okay? You know, I always tell people that, and this, this goes to say, and it used, we used to address the women, but now we address the men as well with the same advice. When you are upset, please communicate that you are upset. Say why. 
when you are not feeling well, don't just be looking sad and upset and angry without telling your spouse that you know I'm not feeling well because I have back pain or my belly is aching or I have a headache. It solves a lot of problems. We don't realize that people sometimes create problems by not explaining or not communicating why they are sad. So the poor husband is trying, you know, he brings you a rose and as he gives it to you and he's smiling, you should get it. It really leaves a bad taste in the mouth because, or should I say, in the heart. Because here's a man trying to make you smile, and he perhaps got that rose from wherever. I hope it's not from the graveyard. He got the rose from wherever it is, and he came and gave it to you. And now you're just looking at him. And you need to tell him, I have a headache, you know, I'm really not feeling well, but thank you so much for this thing, and so on. That's just the point we learned. But let's get back to the story. So I says, I was feeling unwell, and this made me feel even more unwell. And I was a young, innocent person who had never done anything wrong. Not at all. Not at all. And she said, you know, here we are listening to people talking. I began to cry. And she was crying. And she says, I got back home. And the Prophet ﷺ greeted me. Salam alaikum. And he says, Kay fatiko. You know the question? How is that one? And she says, I asked him, please can I go to meet my parents? Beautiful question. Imagine. Please can I go and see my parents? There is a problem here. Obviously, she didn't say the whole detail, but she knows that there is an issue. Can I go and visit my parents? And he says, yes, you may. Yes, you may. So she ran home. That time, it wasn't far away. You know, you're married in Australia and your parents live in Britain. Subhanallah. It wasn't as bad as that. It was around the corner, not even around the corner, perhaps even less than that. I was actually told now that Medina Munawwara, the size of the Haram that we see today, is larger than the size of the entire Medina of the time of Rasulullah. So you can imagine where the house was. Just in the next stop, Allah Akbar. Now I found us uh, goodness. So, amazingly, we find when she goes home, she told her mother, Mom, you know, this is what people are saying. Listen, I found out from Bumbo Misbah that this is what I is saying this and so on and so forth. And the mother says, You know what? Listen to the comfort of the mother. Umm Ruman, anha, the wife of uh, Abu Bakr, the the mother of Aisha, anha. she says, You know, my beloved daughter, you're a young, pretty girl who's married, your husband's so happy with you, he loves you so much. So we'll definitely get people who say things here and there. You know, just take it easy. How do we need it? You know, we can say, Relax, take it easy. You know, take it easy. Don't worry, just ignore these people. They say things, they will always say things. You know, my father always tells me, if you want to gauge your success, just count your enemies. If they're decreasing in number, you are becoming more successful. If they're decreasing in number, something wrong. Allah Allah, something big is wrong. Even if you have a business and now your business is booming, you, you will know that you're doing well when people really are trying so hard to do you down. That's when you know something right is happening. But the minute everyone is okay with you, I think you can do better. I think you can do better. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't look at those who spread rumor about you and those who hate you as something bad. It actually is a sign of recognition that you have achieved something. SubhanAllah, in most cases, it is a sign of recognition. And even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to develop further because when people really want to see you down and you are determined to work harder, you will work much harder than you would have had there been no one wanting to see your downfall. So you would be more alert and you would be more aware of what's going on and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us more growth in the good way. Amen. So the mother gives her beautiful advice and says, Don't worry and so on. But she was not happy. She was crying, crying so much. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala definitely had a plan. Anyway, Rasulullah this thing lasted a month and things started becoming clear. Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salud, who was the head of the hypocrites who had a gripe against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the reasons was because they were about to appoint him the leader of Medina when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made hijrah to Medina and he was appointed the leader, obviously as a Nabi. So he had a gripe to say, okay, I will just pretend to be a Muslim, but my aim is to drop him and his family and all the good believers and so on, and to really make sure that whatever happens will happen negative and not positive. So this was Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salud, he was known as Raksul Munafiqi, the head of the hypocrites in Medina Munawwar. He caused a lot of problems. One of them was, he created the tale. He made up the story. See also, Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, this happens in our communities, nearly every community. 
and sometimes our tongues get messed. And sometimes we are Hindu people. It is one of the most dangerous sins. Today I was reading the hadith of Abu Hurairah of the Allah, which is Muqtafaq Ali, where the Prophet says, Ijtani bi sab'al mubiqat. Stay away from the seven major sins. The seven sins which are which will beckon this most severe punishment. The sin would commit or would cause a lot of punishment to be drawn towards us. And one of the things is to accuse the innocent, believing women of that which they do not do. And obviously men will be included as well. But the hadith makes mention of the women, because people are quick to accuse women. A man can get up and you know cleanse himself, say, hey, what are you talking about? I'll beat you up or I'll do this. A man can do a lot of things. But a woman sometimes she has no option but to sit back and perhaps ask Allah's help. Sometimes there is very little she can do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the dignity of our women. And may He grant them respect and may He make us from those who can respect them and speak highly of them. So what happens in our society is we nudge each other and we say, you know what, did you see that? You know what, you saw those two people, they having an affair. Those are the words we're talking about today. They having an affair. You know what that means? You have accused them of the most dangerous thing you can ever accuse them of. What's going on here? They having an affair. You know what the word affair means in our language today? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. It is a dangerous word. It is so dangerous that it will cause the downfall of ourselves, our offspring sometimes, our surroundings and generations to follow. Sometimes we find the damage of the statement we've uttered. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. More so, we ourselves will face the wrath of it in our lives before we actually die. We face a wrath of it. Today, I like to think, you know, a lot of people go through a lot of divorce. May Allah protect us. Some of it obviously for the right reasons. But sometimes you wonder, why did this happen? And sometimes you just begin to think, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala penalize these people? Are they punished because they utter words about others? So you talk about the marriages of others negatively, watch what happens in yours. You talk about the children of others negatively, watch what, happen, watch what happens to your children. You talk about the lives of others negatively, see your life go upside down. This is why we have stories like this mentioned in the Quran. This did not happen because any one of them were... Our mouth to close the mouth because the minute we open our mouth, we enter the ranks of those like Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salud, the head of the hypocrites. It's just that there's no revelation to actually pinpoint who are the head of the hypocrites, but we may just be some of them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never do that to us. Watch your tongues, my brothers and sisters. Be careful. Who you say what about or what you say about others, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us safe. So you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mention of the detail of this in Surah Al-Nur starting from verse number 11 all the way up to quite a few verses, 10 verses all at once and the other verses a little bit later. And even before these verses, in the whole of the Quran, there is made mention of rules and regulations of accusation of human beings, women in particular, although a person who accuses a man is also included in that. And beautiful how a woman is made mention of in the Quran, but the ruling is for men as well. Sometimes women say, you know, every time Allah speaks in the masculine gender, saying, oh, the, the men and who you believe, it's obviously men, men and so on. Why is it that we're just included by the way? Well, these are verses where men are included by the way. So if you accuse a woman, that's what the Quran says, then you should be punished in this way. But Men are included in that. If you were to accuse a man, the same thing would happen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So, Aisha radiallahu anha, they created the tale, Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salud, and he was the main one who fabricated it. He faced the punishment in the dunya and in the akhir. In the dunya as well. There was a time when he lost his eyesight, and so many things happened to him, and he was known as the worst. He had a bad life, he led a life of misery because of the rotten behavior that he had, because of what he did. And there were others who had missed their tongues. Some of them engaged in Tawbah later on, so Allah forgave them later on. And they were forgiven also by the family of Abu Bakr Siddiq of Allah Anha, but by Aisha of Allah Anha and by Rasulullah and so on. But they had missed their tongues initially, such as the Gideon examples made mention of in the books of Tafsir and even in the Ahadith. Hassan ibn Thabit of Allah Anha, he was one of those who by error, he spread the tale. So he did not create the news, but 
he told him, did you hear what happened? You see, this is, what, this is what's going on. And one of them was, Mislah ibn Adar. We heard the name of Allah, Allah's peace and blessings be upon them. They engaged in Tawbah, obviously they were forgiven. And their Tawbah is made mention of as well. But they spread the tale. When the tale was spread, they were known as those who did the wrong thing. One of them was Hamlet, Binti Jaksh, radiallahu anha. She also uttered a few bad words against Aisha. So what happened? Their names were recorded in history and they were known and they became people who were known as those who fell. Halaka man halak. You know, whoever fell in it, fell in it. They were from amongst them. May Allah protect us. And then there were others who did not fall in it. We'll get to that in a moment. But let's go back to this Aisha radiallahu anha. Innocent girl, innocent lady. Innocent, very innocent, pure, completely pure. And people are spreading a tale that now has got to the ears of so many. So the Prophet ﷺ was already very somber in his behavior because he wanted closure here. He wanted to know what happened and revelation would inform him, but revelation had not come. So many days were passing. So Aisha anha asks her mother that are the people of the city talking about it? And she says, yes, they are talking about it, which means the rumor is being spread by certain people and some are spreading the tale. So watch out. She began to cry. She could not sleep properly. She could not eat properly. She, could, she used to cry so much. She says, my tears ran out. I'm making dua to Allah. I know I'm clean. I know Allah is going to clear my name. I know so much. But look at this. People are spreading tales. People I know. People who we know very well. People who are related to us are saying bad words about us. And subhanAllah, it is a test from Allah to watch. To watch who is going to do the right thing and who is going to fall. And at the same time, it was there in order to elevate the status of Aisha anha and to teach mankind thereafter a lesson up to Qiyamah as to how to behave and how to utter and how to look at things. May Allah grant us protection. So, 30 days later, a long time later, that is when the clarification came. But if you take a look at how it came, it's amazing because Rasulullah one day called and he called Usama bin Zayd he says, come here, I want to ask you, what should I do in this regard? Obviously, I am the father's cousin of Rasulullah and Usama bin Zayd was most loved by my father, he was known as Ibn Rasulullah and so he asked them a question, what should I do? So Usama bin Zayd says, the only men know to be very pure. She is definitely innocent of this, completely and totally innocent. And he mentioned the good qualities of Aisha and Allah and that Rasulullah heard this. And Ali bin Abi Talib also mentioned good words, and he said, Look, if it is true, if we want to find out, why don't you ask the one who works for her? Known as Bariyah. Bariyah worked for Aisha and Allah. She was one of the slaves who was freed by Aisha and So. Prophet called Bariyah Allah and asked her, What do you think? She says, You know what? You're talking of an innocent person. She's a young lady, very innocent. She is at home and she is so clean and when she mentioned good things about Allah. When the Prophet got up and he spoke to his companions, one narration says he was on the mimbab, he says, Many are holy, you are doing the Bala 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 Who is going to avenge me? This man here, or a person whose harm has reached my family. Who can call this man out, basically? Who was the man? The Bible said, but the name was not mentioned yet. Which means the Prophet is so upset that he now is believing within him that this is an entire rumor, but we need to sort it out, we need to stop it. So you find Sadi Muhammad. Al-Ansari, he gets up and he says, Oh Messenger, I will deal with a man. You tell me who he is. If he is from these people, we'll deal with you in this way. And if he is from those people, we'll deal with you in that way. We'll talk him out. Who is he? Say his name. And immediately, Sa'ad ibn Mubarak, who was also uh, one of the Ansar, one of the high level Ansar, he felt in his heart that you know, these people might just kill a man from amongst us. So he got up and the, the argument was he said, no, 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 we won't execute him, but we can do something else. And the two began to debate while the Prophet was sitting there. And Aisha Allah said, I was crying, crying so much that my tears had stopped flowing because there were no more tears left. And I don't know what to do. And I don't know 
You know, you know I, I absolutely have no idea. Besides the mercy of Allah, it is Allah alone who will come through with some form of clarification. She said, I never expected verses of the Quran to be revealed because I felt my issue was so small to be mentioned in such a great word of Allah. But I knew that somehow, maybe through a dream or through other means, the Prophet will get to know. And you will know clearly that this is absolute nonsense. So, she then says, then the Prophet entered my room one day and he says, Oh Aisha, he greeted and he says, Oh Aisha, you know, if you have done something wrong, tell us, you know, Allah is Allah will forgive you, and so on. And he spoke to her that way. And he says, that if not, Allah will reveal, or Allah will cleanse your name. Allah will cleanse your name. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes us all good reputation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our women folk, especially from being accused of that which they have not done. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to recognize and realize the seriousness of words that we utter from our mouth, which hurt the hearts of people, which are untrue, and the fact that they definitely return to visit us negatively unless we engage in tawbah and ask the person for forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So, she says, I told my father, oh my father, answer him on my behalf. In front of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she's saying, Oh, my father, give an answer for me. My behalf. What is the father going to say? He says, Oh, my daughter, I don't know what to say to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she says, I look at my mother. She says, Oh, my mother, say something to him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She says, I don't know what to say to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she was crying. And when she was crying, there was a visitor who had asked to enter. Just before this incident, this final incident I'm talking about. And she had allowed this lady to enter, and the two of them were crying together. So, you know, when people spread rumor about someone, they don't want to meet anyone. They don't want to see anyone. They don't trust anyone anymore. Because anyone who visits you could just be a person who wants to come and collect tales and spread even more tales. But there was one lady who came and she was genuine. She was allowed to enter. She by Aisha she came in and at the same time she helped her cry. Helped her cry, meaning she was with her and saying, don't worry, and so on. And the two of them were sobbing and crying together. So she says, then the Prophet got up and as he's walking away, revelation came to him. And when revelation came to him, the moment after the revelation came to him, he turns around and he says, Ya Aisha, Abshi Ya Aisha. Now that is a powerful word. Powerful word, Abshi. Good news to you, O Aisha. A month has passed. Crying, so much happening. If my husband believes that I am absolutely innocent, there's nothing else I want. You know, between husband and wife, if for as long as the two of you believe in the innocence of the other, there is no harm. People can say what they want. People can believe what they want. For as long as you know, your spouse knows. And you know, when it happens to a person not related to their spouse, then for as long as you know and Allah knows, there is nothing else you need to worry about. Perhaps Allah wants something greater for you. It is a point of success that people sometimes spread rumor about you. I sometimes think that if there is no rumor about you, you can actually do better. People might think, what does he mean? They will find out. People have to say this on all levels, even little children. You find at school, one says something about the other. From that age, they're already going on. Rumor, this person did this. Oh man, she, she cheated in the examination. But I didn't cheat. But that was just because I wanted you to get a zero. It happens. So if you're doing well, that's what it means. May Allah protect us. Just make sure that nothing is true. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come to spirit. So he says, Allah has revealed Quran in your regard. She was and, and he began to read verses. And her mother says, Get up. Get up to him, meaning him, get up to embrace him. And she says, No way. It's Allah who cleanses my name, not him. Look at her. Aisha Allah Anna. This is made mention of in the Ahadith and even in the books of Tafsir and Kathir also makes mention of it. Where the narration that says, the mother says, Get up to him. And she says, No, I will thank Allah and Allah alone. She's in, in an emotional state. Now the verses have been revealed. Those who have come with the great accusation, and if, if it is the great accusation, 
Those who have made up this great accusation are from amongst you. They are a group from amongst you. Which means they are in your midst. They are from amongst you, a group from you. They have come up with this fabrication. Allah says, don't think it is bad for you, it is actually good for you. With our brains, we wouldn't be able to understand. But take a look at the cleanliness of Aisha. It has become good to believe that Aisha was unclean. Why? Because it is denial of a verse of the Quran. Amazing. So if you take a look at people who swear, now for example, you will find that the Quran has brought about a couple of verses that have mentioned her purity to the degree that if a person denies a verse of the Quran, they will leave the fold of Islam. And this is why we say the purity of Aisha is undisputed because it is a verse of the Quran that we cannot deny. She was known as a person who her purity was mentioned from the seven heavens, meaning Allah revealed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us with us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her, Aisha of Allah Rahman, and may He really unite us with Ummahat al Mu'mineen in a way that is befitting in Jannah. May we learn from them, may we see them. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, may He grant us that goodness in Jannah and Paradise, and may He bring us all together as well to His mercy. Amen. So, this was a great accusation, and Allah says, It is better for you, it is good for you. But who are khayyun, lakum. Indeed, it is better for you, it is good for you. And for them who swear it, Allah says, Each one of them who spread the tale and were involved in it, in any way, shall taste part of the punishment, the punishment they deserve, the portion of punishment they deserve. So when I mess my tongue, or you mess your tongue, spreading rumor about someone, remember Allah has said, the portion of punishment will definitely visit you at some stage. So watch what you say. And this is an accusation against anyone in anything, although the lesson is derived from the great accusation. This is why it's mentioned in the Quran, for us to derive lesson from it, not just for us to be people who say, wow, beautiful verses, beautiful story, and walk away. No! Am I involved in spreading rumor about someone? If I am, well, I need to learn from these verses. And if I haven't, I've wasted my time being a Muslim because I don't even know what the Quran is all about. So Allah says, وَالَّذِي تَعَلَّا كِنَاهُ مِنْهُمْ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And the source of it, the root of it, the one who created the tale, the main culprit shall face severe punishment. Adabun Adim, a great punishment is awaiting the one who was the source of it. So every tale has a source. Every story has a source. And the source will obviously receive the bulk of the punishment. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of a beautiful verse thereafter. Abu Ummu Ayyub al-Ansari. You see, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was a man of the Ansar of Allah. His name was Khalid ibn Zayd al-Ansari. A beautiful, powerful man, loved by all and so on. He served Muhammad sallallahu in so many ways, especially just when the Hijrah happened and so on. And his wife, Umm Ayyub, told him, O oh, Abba Ayyub, did you hear what the people are saying about Aisha? Radiallahu anha. Immediately he said, you should not be saying these words. Do you, would you ever do that, Umm Ayyub? She says, never. So he said, well, know that Aisha is purer than you. The story is closed. Did you hear the question? Would you ever do that, Umm Ayyub? She said, never. Well, you should then know that Aisha is purer than you. Like I said at the beginning, if we know that in our midst or within ourselves, we would never do this thing or something that is bad, we should know that those who are Sahaba of Allah, they would never have done that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. So this is why he asked the question, would you do it? No. But if you wouldn't do it, she would never ever have done it. It's all the don't even talk about it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and mentioning this incident and giving advice and warning those who uttered the words, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمَعْتُمُوا غَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا فَقَالُوا هَذَا إِفْكُمْ Why have you not, when the, or when the 
the believers had heard these words, they should have uttered, just like Abu Ayyub al Masari and uttered, thinking goodness within themselves, that if we couldn't do it indefinitely, she wouldn't have done it. This is indeed a fabrication and it's a lie. Then Allah says, لَوْلَا جَاءُوا عَلَيْهِ بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَاءِ Why had they not come up or had they not come up with four witnesses to prove what they are saying? If they don't, فَإِذْ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِالشُهَدَاءِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْكَالِبُونَ This is the law of the Sharia. It came to protect the dignity of a woman. It came to issue respect to a female. It came to safeguard her name and to increase her in rank and to ensure that nobody utters bad words about her. Allah says, if you want to accuse her, if you have not come with four good eyewitnesses who have witnessed it, those are liars in the eyes of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a verse before these verses, in Surah al that if a person comes up with an accusation against the chaste women, they should definitely be lashed, 80 lashes. Unless they bring about four eyewitnesses because they are liars. So today when someone says, did you hear about this woman? Did you hear about that girl? Did you hear what this one did? They need to bring up four eyewitnesses. If not, they are liars. And, and the Sharia, the Sharia law would get them and penalize them by lashing them 80 lashes each for having uttered with their mouth something that was derogatory against a believing woman who believes in Allah, a chaste woman whom they have no evidence against according to the Sharia. So a rumor is not evidence. A feeling in your heart is not evidence. People say, I have a feeling, I have a strong feeling, I have this. Your strong feeling is not evidence. So much so that when the verses of Qadr, which is slander, were revealed and Allah says, in the verses in Surah An-Nur, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of وَالَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ الْمُحْصَنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَىٰ فَجَلِدُوهُمْ ثَمَانِينَ جَلْدَىٰ Those who want to accuse the chaste women, the believing women, those who want to accuse the chaste women and do not come up with four eyewitnesses, you need to lash them 80 lashes of oh, Allah. وَلَا تَقَبَلُوا لَهُمْ شَهَادَةً أَبَدًا And you should never ever believe anything they say thereafter. Whatever they say, discount it. If they bear witness regarding something, throw it out of the window. Why? They are liars and accusers. That's who they are. They have learned the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah continues to say, and this is something very very strong, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأُولَٰئِكَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْكَالِبُونَ They are the ones who are the liars in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how they, they are sinful. They are sinful. They are bad. They are the people who have earned the wrath of Allah. Imagine just by accusing someone, just by saying, you know what, this person has done this and you have no evidence. You, what is shabby evidence you need for eyewitnesses for that type of an accusation? If you don't have it, believe me, we don't want to hear you. Not only that, if it was Sharia, they would call you in and penalize you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. You cannot just say with your tongue what suits your, your mazaj, what suits your own whims and fancy. I cannot just accuse you or anyone of anything I feel like. No, I'm responsible. In the Sharia, we are all free to say whatever we want to say on condition that we do not trample over the rights of others. That's the difference between freedom in Islam and freedom outside of Islam. When those outside of Islam say you are free to speak and you have freedom of speech, they say you have freedom of insulting, you have freedom of lying, of accusing, you have freedom of spreading rumor. But Islam says no, a woman is too high for that. You have freedom of utterance in Islam, but only if you are not going to trample the rights of others. So, Islam says, you do not have the freedom of insulting, you do not have the freedom of spreading rumor, you do not have the freedom of accusing, you do not have the freedom of swearing, you do not have the freedom of uttering that which is irresponsible, that is Islam. 
And that is the dignity of Islam. And this is what will last in Islam up to the day of Qiyamah because these verses were revealed in order to sort the matter out for once and for all. So there are people sometimes who don't understand the rulings of Islam. So they think that to spread a rumor is just an easy thing. And you know, I won't face the wrath of Allah. Believe me, you will taste it in your life. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, I want to cry. When people ask for help and they scream for help and they yell out for help and they haven't yet asked themselves, why am I facing this wrath? Is it because I have harmed an innocent person? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you have done so, you will taste the punishment in the dunya before the akhirah. So sometimes we are struggling and suffering in our lives, in our families, in our health, and so many things, and we don't know. It is because we have spread rumor about someone. That's why we say, if I were to use the word shut up, I would actually not be wrong because it is so serious that even the word shut up is too light in that particular case. You need to keep your mouth completely closed. Never ever find a tale juicy. Never ever find a rumor that which is worth spreading. No, 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 my brothers. Never, my sisters. You pay for it and you pay heavily for it. Allahu Akbar. So this great accusation in Surah Al-Nur is not made mention of just like that. It is made mention of in order for me and you to watch my tongue, to be careful, to have a good perception of others, find 90, 100 excuses to look at the good that people perhaps might have been engaged in. If you were spreading something good and you were wrong, you are far more noble than a person who spread something wrong and then the right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقْبَلُوا لَهُمْ شَهَادَةً أَبَدًا وَأُولَٰئِكَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Those who want to accuse the women, they are sinful in the eyes of Allah. Don't ever accept their witness. When they never witness, don't. And Allah says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ تَابُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَٰلِكَ وَأَصْلَحُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Except those who ask Allah's forgiveness. And who ask forgiveness from those whom they have accused. So Allah says, Allah is most merciful. And Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi makes mention of something interesting. He says that the forgiveness of Allah is connected to the sin, but not, not to the acceptance of witness. We will never believe what this person says ever again, even if they've made tawbah. But between them and Allah, the sin is forgiven. So that's what Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi says. The other scholars, some of them say, no, we will, after their tawbah, accept their witness once again. But to mention the difference of opinion to show you how serious it is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and protect us. And this is why in the next verse, or when this was revealed, one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu came to Rasulullah sallallahu And he says, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what if I found my wife with another man? You say, we need to bring four eyewitnesses. By the time I go to collect the witnesses, everything will be over and he'll be gone. And then what? Will I be in alive? So the Prophet ﷺ was silent. And the next day, Hilal ibn Umayyah عنه, comes to Rasulullah ﷺ and he says, Oh Messenger ﷺ, I have a problem. What's the problem? I have found a man with my wife. Oh, and Allah protect us all. And he says, what do I do? Now, this was dangerous because the Sahaba of Allah told him, hey, there were verses revealed just now, just, just previously, which said if anyone comes and they don't have four eyewitnesses, they shall be lashed. Allahu Akbar. Lashed for what? Lashed because you are a slanderous person. You have engaged in slander. You have tried to put someone into disrepute. You have, tri you have tried to put a... What can we say? You have tried to actually mess their reputation, scratch their slate, so to speak. You are saying things that are untrue, so you need to be lashed to wake up. And as we know in the Sharia, penalization is more deterrent than anything else because it is there to uplift the Ummah and to make our lives easy and simple. A lot of people get upset when they see, oh, you know what, the Sharia has hard laws and so on. Well, to be honest with you, if we were to work properly and we were to fulfill what Allah has revealed thoroughly, we would save ourselves from a lot of difficulty that we are going through today. Anxiety, a lot of, can I say, uh, 
There is a lot of mental problems that people are facing today because of depression and so on. We can save ourselves from that, from the, the issues of children, marital issues and so on. All these are connected to the fact that sometimes we do not adopt the laws that Allah has revealed. And we think we know better. We think we know better. So people say, I'm a modern person. So what's the problem? Uh, if I just sit and intermingle, what's, what's wrong? You know, if I, for example, intermingle, my husband's with me. What's the problem? Okay, no problem. I can tell you of more than 100 cases that I know of people who lost their husbands, who lost their husbands to their best friends. I can tell you that. And I can tell you more than a thousand cases of people who lost their wives to their best friends. How's that? Allahu Akbar. So, if you just have to implement the Sharia, we would have saved more than those thousands of lives. And people's marriage is broken. And even after they're lost to their best friends, the best friends get fed up of them after the while and they, they then live depressed saying, I should have just stayed with my man. Well, he was your man. But what happened? You allowed shaitan to become between you and your man. Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us all. So this is why we say, there is a reasoning behind the laws of Allah. Don't think it's clandestine. Do not think it's backward. Don't think for a moment that, you know, when Allah asks us to do this and to do that, then it is something very, very backward. To, to, for your information, do you know that even some of the people of the book from amongst the Jews and so on have rules and regulations that are even stricter than what we have? And sometimes the Orthodox from amongst them are still implementing it and they are leading happier lives than those who don't. Do you know that? But the problem is we're not educated or we haven't traveled the world and we haven't mixed and we don't even know that they are sometimes stricter than we are and sometimes we do things that we, subhanAllah, are not even ashamed of but they become ashamed of how we behave. This is why I go back to the Sharia, go back to Allah and remember something. The laws of Allah are put in place not in order to make our lives difficult, but in order for us to lead the best of life. And Allah says, watch your tongue. If you don't watch your tongue, others will start creating worse stories about you in a matter of years, less than 10 years. That's just a figure put by myself. But I'm saying the general norm is in a few years' time, in a few days' time, sometimes in a little while's time, you have something worse that will come in your direction. Because you planted a seed and you watered it. What will happen besides the growth of the tree that you plant? If you plant a cactus, do you think apples will grow? No. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then revealed verses as the Prophet sallallahu with Bilal ibn Umayyah coming up with this huge statement he's uttered and the Prophet sallallahu is now concerned because he has to prepare to meet out the shari'i punishment and verses were revealed about those who accuse their wives. Oh. Those who accuse their wives. That is so serious in the eyes of Allah that if you would like to accuse your wife, you need to know there is a system, there is a way of doing it. Those countries where which have the Sharia implemented and you have courts, there is a way of doing it. Those who don't, there, there is a way of doing it. Allahu Akbar. Through a panel of scholars and so on in the countries that are uh, not Islamic countries, for example. You cannot accuse your wife. You cannot. You cannot accuse your spouse of something based on rumor. Based on what you think is happening, you cannot. Like I say the other day, I had a bit of negative feedback because I made a statement last week in Cape Town saying that, you know, women say, well, he cheated on me, not realizing that he actually cheated on Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if he hides it from you, my beloved sister, you are happy. He could have been doing it for 12 years, you are happy. But if he knows he's cheating on Allah and he sorts that problem out, you maybe wouldn't even have known, but he's given it up completely because you cannot hide from Allah, but he can't hide from you. Which means the man cannot hide from Allah, but he can hide from you. So when we say, he's my man, I, he's mine, and so on, those statements sometimes seep on to us saying, he cheated on me, not realizing where's Allah in this whole equation. Where is Allah in the whole equation? Bring Allah back into the equation and say, look, if he is fulfilling my rights, Alhamdulillah, he's a good man, and Alhamdulillah, he's doing good things. I cannot accuse him of something based on whims and fancies or something. If he is explained something, Alhamdulillah, take his explanation. But remember, develop that iman in both of you. Sometimes we don't need salah, we couldn't be bothered. We don't want to dress appropriately, we couldn't be bothered. Then we want all our problems in our life to be sorted out? No! They will, we have sown a seed of problems. How then can we have solutions when we have not yet sown the seeds of solutions? 
So when you now start reading your salah, you're an honest person, you've given up your bad habits, you've cut out your time that you've wasted on the net, pornography is cut out, everything else is cut out, all these innocent chats are cut out, and you know the dress is okay, everything is okay, all you've done is you've planted the seeds of solutions to your problems. You water it and keep watering it, your tree will keep growing. Don't think it's an overnight thing. Someone says, you know, I never read salah, but I read fajr, my problems are still not solved. Come on, come on. You're only planting the seed. You need to now water the plant, continue further and further. Then only you will find that the, the whole tree will grow and if one or two branches fall out, you're still a happy person. And you're thanking Allah, Ya Allah, you've given me such a beautiful life. I've got so much to thank you for. A lot of us concentrate only on the negatives, yet we have billions of positives. If you want to count the gifts of Allah upon you, you will never be able to, to count them. Never. You cannot circumscribe them. This is something amazing. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses. A person who wants to accuse his wife, he has to do it in a certain way, known as mula'ana. When that happens, the divorce automatically occurs. And you can never, ever, ever get back with them again. You have done something to, so serious and so venomous that you will not be allowed to marry her ever again on condition that you have engaged in mula'ana. So what is mula'ana? Mula'ana means in front of the, the judge or the qadi, the man comes in and he takes far, four qasams in the name of Allah that he promises that he is telling the truth regarding what he saw. And he takes four qasams. And the first one, he says, if I am lying, then the curse of Allah be upon me. So five. So each witness, each time he swears an oath by Allah, the first one is equivalent to one eyewitness. The second one is equivalent to a second eyewitness. The third one is equivalent to a third eyewitness. The fourth one equivalent to a fourth eyewitness. And the Prophet ﷺ did this to Hilal ibn Umayyah And after the four witnesses, he says, Oh Hilal, you better speak the truth. This is something very serious. This is something very strong. It's the wrath of Allah that is being called upon. It is something very, very major in the eyes of Allah. Now you will utter the fifth O or the fifth statement saying, If I am a liar, then the la'na or the curse of Allah be upon me. So Bilal ibn Mayya uttered that. Now he asks the wife, Look, there are four qasams against you. He says he saw this. You now have to take four qasams that he is lying, he is a liar. So the first qasam came, the second one came, the third one came, the fourth one came, and then the Prophet told her, okay. Now the fifth one you need to say, if he is telling the truth, the anger of Allah be upon him. Allah, Allah, Allah. Look at how serious the statement is. From this we can deduce that if you accuse an innocent person of what they have not engaged in, the anger of Allah is upon you. The anger of your maker is upon you. Look at yourself in the mirror. You perhaps would look like a beast. May Allah protect us. You become upset with yourself, your children. You have chaos in the whole home. Your home is turned absolutely upside down. Why? Because the anger of Allah is what you are messing with. You are messing with the anger of Allah. That's why we say, keep your mouth shut. That's what we say. May Allah protect us. May Allah grant our mouths the ability to be shut. May He make us in control of our mouth, my mothers and sisters. My brothers and fathers, never ever utter words of accusation against someone. Don't spread rumor about anyone. Do not, do not, do not, do not. No, don't. You pay for it heavily. And I've said this a second time. So she says, the, the, the woman, the wife of Hilal ibn Umayyah, she thought for a while and so on, and she thought for almost an hour according to one narration. And then she, she took that. A statement and she said, Okay, may the anger of Allah be upon me if he is telling a lie. Uh, sorry, if he is truthful. If he is truthful, the anger of Allah be upon me. Which means if I am lying, may the anger of Allah be upon me. And she says, I will do it. And then the story ends, whatever happened, happened, and so on. But the, the, the point we are drawing from there is to watch our tongues and to be careful. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, When the verses were revealed for Aisha radiallahu anha, later on Allah says, Allah 
والله يعلم وأنتم لا تعلمون. Those who love to spread tales of immorality. So we, we like to spread juicy tales of immorality, whether it is true or not. And in this verse is besides the point. The fact is, we want to spread juicy tales. Nowadays we do it via WhatsApp and via BBM and via everything else and via Facebook and Twitter. We spread tales, juicy details of immoral stories, whether they are true or not. Allah says they will, they will face a punishment in the dunya and then in the earth. Why? What's your crime? The crime is, all you did was you just forwarded a message. That's all you did. And Allah says, لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Painful punishment in the dunya and the akhirah. Didn't I tell you moments ago, you are in pain of some sort? Ask yourself, did I accuse people? Did I spread tales of immorality? Was I happy to spread a dirty tale amongst my friends? If that's the case, to go with Allah. Turn to Allah. Ask Allah's forgiveness. You will save yourself from this painful punishment that Allah is talking about. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah You Allah knows and you don't know. Allah is the knower of all. So be careful, do not spread things amongst the believers. Do you know one of the reasons why you start encouraging people to do that which is bad? You know, a man spreads details to say, Oh, you know what I did? I did this and I did that, and this is how I did it, and this is how nice it was. I went to the club and I did this and I had this and I, whatever. Why are you giving people details of your own sin? For what? People might be encouraged by your action. So even if you are forgiven for your action, you have now resulted, or your statements have resulted in them learning from you after you taught them. And this is why you will be earning a punishment even after you die. Do you know how? Because the hadith says, مَنْ سَنَّ سُنَّةً سَيِّئَةً فَلَهُ وِزْرُهَا وَوِزْرُ مَنْ عَمِلَ بِهَا إِلَى لَمِ الْقِيَامِ Whoever sets a bad example, people are doing bad because of you. You taught them. You were the inspirer. You were the one who started off the bad. So what, what you need to know is, whoever follows that bad example, you are getting the evil of it even after you die, up to the day of Qiyamah. Why would we allow that to happen to us? May Allah use us for the opposite, inshallah. May He use us for that which is good, so that people can be inspired to do good because we did it, or we taught them, or we spoke about it. Amen. So we have this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us to say, severe punishment awaiting those who want to utter words. You know when I read the newspapers? And they tell you the robbers have attacked this place and this is how they had the dynamite and this is how they blew up the door and this is how they went in, this is how they opened the safe and this is what they did. And I'm busy thinking, you know, the journalists think they're doing a good job, but they're teaching people who are innocent how to steal. And sometimes youngsters will look at themselves and say, guys, it was quite easy. He went away with a million dinars. I'm sure we can get away with 500,000. It's so simple. You just got to go and put in a paper clip and you open the door. Who taught you? But I read the newspaper. So this is one of the reasons why this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to spread details of this nature amongst the believers is actually a crime and it is sinful. You don't do it because you're encouraging people to do bad. Allah Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mention of his wrath and his anger. Here we have Aisha radiallahu anha whose cleanliness and purity was revealed from the seven heavens. And this was mentioned in the Quran for a reason, and for many reasons we can say one of them, and that is for it to be a lesson for us, so that we apply it in our lives. This evening, mashallah, we are here in aid of the awareness, the awareness regarding women's diseases and things that women go through silently, things that sometimes they are too embarrassed to speak about, sometimes they don't seek help regarding. My sisters, we are with you, we stand with you. You need help, we are there to help you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know what? This topic was so apt and so great. I was so happy. The great accusation. Not only does it show that, or connected to this particular theme, not only is it that we as men will support you and we will help you and we will really respect you and reach out to you, but at the same time, Harm will not reach you from us. That's one thing you need to know. 
If we cannot benefit you, the minimum is we won't harm you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember that, my beloved brothers and sisters as well. If you cannot harm, if you cannot benefit someone, at least do not harm them. Remember that. So if we cannot be of major benefit to you, the minimum, by mentioning this whole story and by learning a lesson from the great accusation is, the minimum we will not harm you. May Allah protect us from harming one another. And this is why I say, beautiful topic, beautiful theme. Remember my sisters, if you need help, reach out for the help. But to those whom you trust, to those whom you trust. Because sometimes when we reach out to those whom we do not trust, we could be opening a can of worms where people might deal with us in a way that is not befitting the treatment of a believing female. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you integrity. May He open your doors and may He grant you every form of goodness. My brothers and sisters, I have mentioned a little bit of detail regarding this beautiful story of Aisha radiallahu anha. There are still so many issues that we could make mention of. Look at the beautiful tears that were shed thereafter. The tears of joy and Aisha radiallahu anha was cleansed. But today, wahi no longer comes to us. Revelation no longer comes to us. So if we were to accuse people today, yes, they will make dua. They will ask Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may choose to cleanse them. And even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not choose to directly and immediately cleanse them, it is a means of destruction for those who are spreading the rumor. Absolute destruction into smithereens, as I would say. Believe me, why should we do that? Why should we allow ourselves to believe things and to spread things and to create things against one another? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and protection. I hope every one of us can take a lesson home and I hope we can all learn to say good things about one another. Do you know Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu anha, the sister of Hamma bint Jahsh radiallahu anha, she was the co-wife of Aisha radiallahu anha when she was asked by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what do you know and what have you heard about this incident? Do you know what she said? I have protected my eyesight from seeing and I have protected my ears from hearing. All I know about Aisha is goodness. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Imagine she's a co-wife and she has such high words to utter of her co-wife to say I have protected my eyes from seeing and my ears from hearing. So all I know about Aisha عنها, is goodness. Amazing, amazing, subhana rabbi ala. And this is why Allah says, وَلَوْ لَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ قُلْتُمْ مَا كُونُ لَنَا أَن نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَادَا سُبْحَانَكَ هَادَا مُحْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ And had, had they not, or when they had heard, whatever they heard, why didn't they say these words? You see the term, لَوْ لَا is in the meaning of halla. Halla is a warning and an encouragement at the same time to say, when you heard this, you should have said this. And when you heard this, this is what you must say. And why didn't you say this when you heard this? So mention is being made of how, when you heard the story, do you know what you should have said? You should have said, no way. It is not befitting for us to mess our mouth with these dirty words. They are indeed a fabrication. That's what you should say. So when you and I hear a rumor and an accusation against a believing woman, an innocent woman, a person who really we have no solid shari eyewitness evidence against, we need to say, Oh Allah, protect our tongues from being messed from such statements. They are bad words. Oh Allah, forgive us if we've uttered bad words. There is always time to repent. And I want to close on this note. And the note is... That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown us a way out. What is the way out? We need to engage in tawbah. Tawbah is a door. That is a beautiful door. If you ask Allah's forgiveness, He will wipe out your sin. If you ask Allah's forgiveness, He will open your doors of goodness. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who did not have sin, He always asked Allah's forgiveness. Sometimes up to a hundred times a day. Because it is a means of achieving peace. You want peace? Ask Allah's forgiveness a hundred times a day. Seriously, in a proper way. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. And we ask Allah to give us the courage to go up to those whom we might have accused and spread rumor against to say, I have said bad words about you in the past. Can you forgive me? And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a big heart. Like the heart of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And the others who forgave those who wronged them. 
And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forgave those who wronged him as well. May Allah use us to forgive others because when you forgive people, Allah will forgive you as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. It's been a beautiful evening. Until we meet again, inshallah, tomorrow evening, I say, sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiya Muhammad. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.